Welcome everybody to the training. My name is Peter Krause. For those of you that don't know me, I'm our Chief Business Development Officer. Uh, long title, what it basically means is that I'm in charge of all of our new business development, all of our new business initiatives, um, acquisitions of new companies, things of that nature. Uh, I am an actual executive of PLI. You don't see me here because I'm actually right now running our Nashville branch, uh, which was Plastic Card Plus. We still do business as Plastic Card Plus, but it's actually a division of PLI. Okay. Uh, again, as part of my focus of running and taking over our new acquisitions, that's why I'm camped out in Nashville. So for those of you wondering who I am, where I am, that's where I am. Okay. What we're going to spend time talking about today and then again in the second session is really helping everyone understand sales from a slightly different angle. And I look at sales in such a way that I believe there's the science of selling and there's also the art of selling. And I mean, you guys have heard salespeople referred to as a lot of different things. You've heard selling referred to as a lot of different things. When we talk about salespeople, a lot of times, you know, people are referred to as what? People, people, right? You're outgoing, you're a type A personality. Salespeople tend to be described this way. When people talk about the science of selling, they start really talking about how there are metrics and there are things that need to be measured and there's a science to it that if you apply it consistently, you're going to get a certain result, okay? Today, we're going to really focus on talking about the science side and helping you understand the metrics of the business that we do. You guys have all heard it already. You got to do a certain number of calls. You have to do a certain number of this. You have to spend this much time on that. There are actually sound scientific, if you will, reasons why you're being asked to do that. It's not just because management has nothing better to do. I can promise you that much, okay? When we talk about selling, Obviously, there's a certain skill set that I believe is involved in that. You either have the ability to sell or you don't. In my opinion, that's kind of a, you're born with it. It's an ingrained ability. Now, that ability can be enhanced. It can be brought out. It can be, you know, taught in some respects. But the actual raw ability to sell, I don't think can be. And you might agree or disagree, but I've trained and managed a lot of salespeople. And I find that people either get it or they don't. And they either kind of have, like I said, that innate ability or they don't. The science side comes into play where you can take somebody who has that raw talent and who has that ability and you can enhance it or you can bring more of it out. Sports analogies always seem to work. I guess I'm a guy, I don't know, but they always seem to apply. One of the best sports analogies that I can come up with is, and anybody know Michael Jordan? I don't even care if you don't follow basketball, everybody knows who Michael Jordan is, okay? If you look at the Chicago Bulls and you look at Michael Jordan and you look at a man by the name of Phil Jackson, anybody know Phil Jackson? Okay. A lot of people would say that Phil Jackson is a professor of the game. You've heard him actually refer to that. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. And I don't think anyone would argue that MJ had a bit of a talent for the game. I think that's fair to say as well. But what's really funny is that Michael Jordan actually wasn't very successful early in his career. He actually wasn't even a starter until his junior or senior year of high school. Anybody know that? Okay. Now, what happened in his career that all of a sudden brought all that raw talent that he had out? Well, in my opinion, it was the fact that he met up with a very good coach who helped give him discipline, helped give him time management, and helped basically enhance the abilities that he obviously already had. And the thing with Phil Jackson is that he absolutely required consistency out of his players. He studied the science of the game, and he said, look, there are certain things that if we go out there every single night and do, it's going to get us a certain result. Well, if you think about it, the same thing really kind of applies to selling. There are some tried and true methods that if you do over and over and over again, they will bring you the same result. The challenge for salespeople is that a lot of times you're trying the same things over and over again that don't work, but yet you're expecting a different result. Anybody know what that's called? I like a better word, stupid. But it is insanity. Okay, but you know, people get offended when I say that I'm not calling anybody in this room stupid. Okay, what I'm saying is that if you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, how smart really is that? Yet, if you think about it, a lot of you come in day after day after day, you go to your desk, you go to your cubicle, you pick up your headset or your, set or your phone, and that's exactly what you're doing. Hopefully, between today and tomorrow, you're going to walk away not feeling that way and actually being empowered with some tools that you can use when you go back to your desk and not just keep repeating the same things over and over again. Okay. When you look again at something like an MJ and a Phil Jackson, there's a perfect example of a marriage between the art and the science. Okay, you've got somebody who is an absolute student of the science of the game, somebody who absolutely had the raw talent for the game. The combination became what? I mean, a basketball dynasty. I mean, not even a basketball dynasty, just a sport dynasty. I don't think anyone can argue with that. When, 
here's the reality and the reason why metrics are so important, and we'll talk about this a lot. What gets measured gets done. Have you ever heard that before? Okay, it's just a fact. Things that are not measured, things that are not looked at, things that are not tracked, tend to kind of fall off the radar, they're forgotten about, and they just simply don't get done. The reason management focuses so much on metrics is for that reason. You know, if we say we want to achieve a certain goal, how do we know that we're getting there? How do we know we're even on the right track? How do we know we're on the right path? We don't unless we're measuring it, okay? And we'll talk about that's not just enough to have a goal way out in the distance. You actually have to have smaller incremental goals that help you track and check and make sure you're going in the right direction. Okay, and I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but as a salesperson, isn't it a little daunting, maybe even a little scary? It's the beginning of a month. Here it is the first of June, right? Well, it's the third or whatever, but it's the first of June for you. Sales manager comes to you and says, all right, I need you to do 50,000 in sales this month. You're like, okay. You know, it's the first of June. I got 22 some odd days and working days in June. Uh, okay, I could do that. But yet you have no clue how you're going to do it. How are you going to get there? Right there it is June 1. How are you by June 30th going to be at $50,000? We're going to talk a lot about how we break that down and we make that a much more manageable and actually achievable goal for you guys. What I really want to show you and what I really want you to walk away from all this is that most people view metrics as just a tool for management. Right? It's a, it's a stick that we use to beat you with. Right? It's a measuring stick that we use just to gauge you and judge you. There's some truth to that. I mean, obviously we use it you know, because we need to see how you're doing and we need to benchmark and we need to compare you to others. What I want you to walk away with is an understanding that you can actually use the metrics to help you. That it will help improve your performance at your desk every single day and you won't have management breathing down your neck going, why aren't you making these calls? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Because you'll be doing it on your own. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions so far? Haven't lost anybody yet? No? All right, good. Okay, so let's talk about the actual science of the sale, all right? And again, we talked a little bit about already that salespeople tend to be described as what? Type A personalities, they're people people, they're outgoing, they're dynamic, they're all these different things. You know, maybe earlier in your life or in your career, somebody told you, oh, man, you could sell ice to Eskimos, right? Anybody ever heard that? No? Okay. Those are all typically very true characteristics of a salesperson. Here's the problem. Everything that makes you that makes you what? What doesn't it make you, I should actually say? Anybody? All of you type A, outgoing, dynamic, people, people, okay? You're operating with a certain side of your brain, okay? And that's your right brain, okay? You tend to be artistic. You tend to be a little bit more flowery. You kind of paint pictures with your words, right? That's how, <laughs> that's how, see, now, now we're just like, oh, okay, now I get it. That's me. That's what I'm talking about. That's how most salespeople are described. But when you're like that, what aren't you? Right. You're not detail-oriented. You're not organized. You're a terrible time manager. You don't like dot and I's and cross and T's. You hate paperwork. You hate metrics. Sounding familiar to anybody? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One honest guy in the room. All right. It describes probably 70, 80% of all the salespeople that are out there. All right. What makes them good salespeople doesn't make them good at all that other stuff. When you get somebody who is good at both, those are typically the people that either one, really excel in sales, or two, aspire to management. You know, they can sell, they can actually do the job, but guess what? They can also do the reports, track the progress, right? Dot the I's, cross the T's. They're very, very good at doing both. I, I meet and I train and I manage a lot of salespeople that, you know what, they're happy being salespeople. Leave me alone, let me do my thing. Don't inundate me with paperwork. Don't bury me in these metrics. Just let me do my thing. Anybody ever said that out loud? You might have been thinking it, but did anybody actually say it? Okay. Salespeople have this tendency to say, let me do what I do. I don't want to be doing all this other stuff. The problem with that is that you absolutely have to measure what you're doing and how you're doing it to know where you're going. You've all probably heard it one time or another. You don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. Very, very true statement in sales. If you don't track past performance, okay, you don't know how are you going to get to the next level, how are you going to go in the next direction, how are you going to get to where you want to be. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Again, as I mentioned earlier, metrics are misconstrued as a tool just for management. 
I don't want you to look at them that way. And I don't want to just say that. I really, hopefully, by the time we're done here today, I want you to honestly walk away feeling that way. And you have that kind of aha moment where you're like, oh, okay, now I get it. I see how I can actually use this at my desk and how it can actually benefit me. I believe very strongly, okay, in something that you may or may not have heard before. Anybody know what this is? With them? No? What's in it for me? Salespeople are always asking, what's in it for me? Fair statement? Yeah, come on, Brian. You were honest before. Don't start. All right. Most salespeople are asking, what's in it for me? If I do this, what am I going to get out of it? If I call 100 people today, what am I going to get out of it? If I spend three hours on the phone, what am I going to get out of it? Whether you're saying it out loud, those are the questions that you are asking yourself, and I'm going to answer most of those questions for you. Okay? It's okay to say what's in it for me, but I want, what I want you to understand is that these metrics can actually benefit you, and there is something in it for you. Everybody with me on that? At least conceptually so far? You're all looking at me like I ain't buying it. No? Oh, okay, good. Curiosity is good. I like that. Curiosity is good. All right, and, and I'm going to read this verbatim because I think it says it best. Okay, and again, we already mentioned what gets measured gets done. All right, but here's the thing. How can anyone shoot for a bar if no one knows where the bar is? How can management hold you accountable if they have nothing to measure you against? That's a aha moment in the sense that that's exactly why salespeople hate metrics. All right? I don't want management to be able to really look inside and see what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And it's typically followed with a statement that's as follows. My number should speak for itself. Anybody ever said that? Or I'm already seeing a couple of heads nod. Okay? That's another favorite tidbit of salespeople. My number should speak for itself. We're going to talk about why that's not an accurate statement. I understand why salespeople say it. I'm a sales guy. Okay, but I'm going to explain to you that's not enough. All right, and there are a lot of real reasons why that's not enough. We already talked about how you can't get where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Right? We already mentioned that. All right? More simply put, you need to really understand what benchmarks, what obstacles you need to overcome, and what steps you need to take to get to each level that you're trying to achieve. Like we mentioned earlier, you set this big lofty goal out there a month ahead of time, and you say, that's the number I got to get to. But again, it becomes daunting, scary, and sometimes almost unachievable when you don't know, okay, what do I have to do every single day to actually make that happen? Have any of you ever taken the time to break down that actual monthly goal into a daily goal? Some of you have, some of you haven't. I know management hasn't, and that's something that we're changing here at PLI, and the reason we're doing this training is we want to break it down into more incremental, what I call kind of bite-sized pieces, where instead of looking at a $50,000 number, maybe you're only looking at a $2,000 number. $2,000 number is a little bit easier to swallow, isn't it? Right? How many orders do you have to do a day to do 2,000 in sales? Average ticket of maybe 500, you got to do four orders a day. Can you do four orders a day? See what I mean? It gets a little bit easier, and it's a little bit less of a bitter pill to swallow when you start looking at it that way versus, oh my gosh, I got to do 50,000 in sales this month. How am I going to do it? I hope I get lucky, I hope I get a big sale, I hope somebody calls in and orders a million cards tomorrow. Right, you're hoping, and I can tell you something, hope is not a strategy. Everyone ever see that book? Okay, hope is not a strategy, All right, especially in sales. It will definitely, definitely come back and bite you. All right. The problem with using the number or your number as the only measurement, okay, is that there's a thing in sales and a thing in business actually, have you ever heard of modeling or forecasting? Okay. We all do it. Every business does it. Small businesses do it. You know, large corporations do it and everybody in between. Here's the problem with forecasting and modeling. There's two kinds, bad and wrong. Okay? It's at best an educated guess. What it's basically based on is you take past performance. Okay? So let's say last year we did X millions in sales and we say, "Okay, we did that last year. How much more do we want to do this year?" Very few companies project they're going to do less. Sometimes they do in economic situations, whatever. But let's assume we're projecting that we're going to do more. They take the number that we did last year, and we say we'd like to increase sales by 10% this year. Everybody with me? Okay. And that becomes the sales goal for the company for that calendar year. Now, what's wrong with that formula? A couple things. One, how do we know the number we did last year was the best we could have done? Does that make sense? How do we know? 
if the entire sales organization, and nobody get offended, most of you are new, so you can't get offended yet, okay? But if the entire sales organization only operated, let's say, 50% of capacity last year, meaning they only did 50% of what they could have done, and all we're asking for this year is for a 10% increase in that, we could probably do that, right? We could probably achieve that, but we're still only doing 60% of what we're really capable of. Everybody with me? That's one of the major, major flaws with forecasting is it's not an exact science. And if you just take that and build on that, it can be a very slippery slope. All right? The same thing is done with individual salespeople. What sales management does is they take this modeling and they take this forecast, right? And they say, $50 million. I've got 50 salespeople. Every salesperson's got to do a million dollars. Hopefully they don't do it that literally, but you get the idea. They literally take the number and they start breaking it down. It, they waterfall it down, it's called, and everyone gets assigned a number. Okay, you need to do 50, you need to do 100, you need to do 75, whatever. A couple problems with that. Again, built on a flawed model of a forecast. Maybe you did 50 last year as an average. It's just saying, well, you did 50 last year. You should be able to do 75 this year. Okay, you see what it's, it's an educated guess. It's not a wish, although it probably in some cases is. But it is at best, like I said, an educated guess. The other problem with that, when you set goals that way, and especially I don't like, I, I never just hand a salesperson a number and say, here's what you have to do. What I do, and what you're going to start seeing happen more and more here, is I meet with the salespeople and I say, look, here's what I need you to do, but let's talk about this number. What do you think you're capable of? What do you think that you can do? Do you think you're going to do more than last year, less than last year? Let's talk about your business. What's going on? Because what I want is I want to come to an agreement on a number that I'm not only happy with, but that you can also live with. So that you buy into that number and you take some ownership of that number. If I just hand you a number and you don't make it, what are you going to say? Yeah, it's your fault. That was a stupid number. I was never going to make that number anyway. You know, you're setting me up to fail, man. What are you doing? Right? Have anybody ever felt that or said that to a manager? Okay, but yet when you sit and you meet with a manager and you say, and you, have, you come to an agreement and you say, okay, I'm willing to put my name on that number. That's what I am shooting for. One, you take ownership of it. Two, you're way more likely to actually hit it because you have bought into it. Is everyone with me on that? Okay, so just using straight modeling or forecasting to come up with a number for a group or for an individual doesn't work. And it is why, again, your number isn't enough. Again, how do we know that number is the best that you can do? And I'm going to make myself unpopular real early in this. If you are hitting your current forecasted number and you're not doing the required number of daily calls and time on the phone, you're not doing your job. I'm going to say that again. If you are hitting your forecasted number, but you are not spending the required amount of time on the phone and making the required number of calls a day, even though you're hitting your number, you're not doing your job. And to make myself even less popular, what I'm going to suggest is that your number's too low. Everyone with me? Okay? Because there's no way, if you're not doing the metrics that we're going to talk about, and you're hitting your number, that that's the best that you can do. Again, going back to the MJ Phil Jackson scenario, his job was to bring the best at MJ he could. Have him, you know, just leave everything out on that basketball floor, give it his all. We're supposed to do the same of you. You know, we're supposed to expect 100% out of each of our individuals and out of each of our departments, not 50%, not 60%. Does that make sense? So we got to figure out what is Brian's 100%. Okay, what is the absolute most that he can produce given all the right circumstances? And once we figure that out, we're going to drive him to it, we're going to push him to it, and we're going to keep him there. That's, what we're, that's our responsibility, I believe, as an organization. Your part is to keep fighting for it, pushing for it, and wanting it. Okay, and we're going to talk about a little bit of that next. Any, any questions so far? Everyone understanding the forecasting modeling that I'm talking about? Anyone hating me yet? No? Okay. That means I'm doing something wrong. Okay. All right. So when we talk about metrics, what we're trying to look at and we're trying to break down is all of the other elements that make up that number. I tell salespeople this all the time, and I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression of me because you really don't know me. Um, I have fired my best performing salespeople, and I have kept my worst performing salespeople from time to time. Why? Any ideas? Potential. It's not a bad reason. That is, that's part of it. 
Attitude is a very big part of it. Huge part of it. Okay? I will take someone who at the moment is underperforming but has the ability, has the right attitude, is working 100 plus percent every single day they come to work because I know I can work with that person and I can make that person the next MJ. Well, not literally, but okay. If I've got somebody who's hitting their number but has nothing but a negative attitude, doesn't want to do the work, feels that they're above everybody else, better than everybody else, uh, smarter than me, smarter than the company, smarter than their customers, I can assure you in my world that person doesn't last very long. Okay, it's not just about the number. The, the, trust me, <laughs> the number is important. Okay, but it is not just about the number. There are a whole lot of other elements that make you a productive, effective, and useful member of the team. The metrics that make up your number is what we're going to start breaking down here right now because here's the thing. Again, if your goal or your number was based on a flawed model, we got to start looking at, okay, is this person really performing to the best of their ability? Are they hitting all the other metrics? And if they are, okay, then maybe they're right where they should be. But if they're not, then maybe this has a little bit more horsepower than we thought. You follow me? Yes? Okay. All right. So when we start talking about what metrics should be measured, all right, there's been a large emphasis, and those of you that are new, if you haven't been hearing it, I'm surprised, but you're going to be hearing it. There's been a lot of emphasis on the number of calls you make, the amount of time you spend on the phone, and the overall quality of those calls. Is that true? Yes? Okay. Why is that? Any ideas? But why, why are we concerned with the number of calls that you make, the amount of time you spend on the phone, and for those of you that might be hitting your number currently but aren't hitting those daily requirements, why are they busting your chops? Why? It's a good reason. Okay. No wrong answers. All, all correct. The main reason we really emphasize it is because we know that there's something, and again, we're talking about the science of selling here today. We know there's a tried and true formula that applies in any business, no matter what you are selling. And we're going to talk about it. Have you ever heard sales is a numbers game? Right? Sales is a numbers game. Okay? And we're going to talk about how that breaks down and exactly what that means to you and how you're going to use those numbers in a minute. The thing I want to talk about real quick before we jump to that is, um, anyone seen Pretty Mo Woman, the movie? Most people in this room? Okay. Got to have a dream. Everyone's got to have a dream. Remember that scene? Okay. You have got to have a goal for yourself. It is not enough for the company or for management to set a goal for you. You have to have your own goal. Everyone's goal is subjective. Everyone's goals are different. Some people are directly money motivated. Some people it's a bit more of a tangible thing. For some, it has nothing to do with it. Most of the salespeople that I've interacted with are very much motivated by money in some way, shape, or form. Okay, they're not coming to work every day to do charity work. They're coming because they want to make some money. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Whatever motivates you, whatever goals you want to set for yourself, set them and make them tangible. So when I sit down and I have my goal setting meetings, if you will, with my salespeople, I ask them, I said, well, where do you want to be a year from now? Where do you want to be three years from now? You know, what are your goals? You know, do you want to take a vacation this summer? Are you planning to go somewhere for the holidays? You know, you've been renting for the last 10 years. Are you looking to buy a house anytime soon? We talk about stuff like that. I'm not there to be their life coach or their parent, okay? But I am there to help them set realistic goals that can get them going in the direction they want. Because here's the thing. You guys all know how much money you make hourly, and you all know what your commission plans are. And we're not going to discuss them, okay? But you all know what they are. You know how much you need to sell and what you need to do to make the money you want to make, right? Have you ever actually sat down to figure it out? Have you ever sat down and gone, okay, on this plan, I need to sell this much on average to make this much per month to make this much for the year so that I can do this, 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 and this. If you're not doing that, you should be, okay? And then if you want to translate that into a tangible thing or trip or a savings number you want to put in your account, again, whatever it is, that's not for me to say or for me to judge, do it. I know, for example, a lot of guys are very visual, okay? So we put pictures up of stuff. You know, I want that new car, I want that new house, I want that new boat. So what do I do? I cut out a picture of it and I put it right at my desk. I'm staring at it every single day. So where I want to coast that day or when I want to take it easy that day or I don't want to work quite that hard that day, 
I check myself and I go, ah, I'm not going to get that boat if I slack today. I'm not going to get that boat if I slack this week. I'm certainly not going to get it if I slack this month. Everybody with me? Okay, so whatever works for you, do it. Don't just let management or the company set your goals for you. Be involved in the process and, like I said, take ownership of it. Okay, everybody with me? All right. So again, now let's say we have a goal. We have a sales goal. We have a personal goal. Now what? All right. As we started to talk about already, okay, we have a keen focus on phone calls. Okay, we also have a keen focus on the time that we are on the phone. As I started to say, the reason that is, is we know that this ratio, hopefully you can see that camera guy, uh, applies in selling. Okay, and it's 10-3-1. And we're going to break down exactly what that means. Just so you understand, this isn't like Peter Krause's theory on selling. Okay, this is, this is tried and true. Universities have proven these statistics. Very large organizations have tried them, tested it, and I've been trying and testing this over 15, 20 years. Okay, I'm older than I look, by the way. Okay, so, <laughs> so this, this works and it applies. When we talk about sales is a numbers game, this, whenever you've heard somebody saying that, that's exactly, or this is exactly what they're talking about, 10, 3, one. What does 1031 mean? You know? Phone calls, reinvestment, and sales. Mm, close. Sorry, out of frame. <laughs> okay, that is close. Uh, I look at it a little bit differently, and it is, okay, yes, 10 calls. Okay, out of the 10 calls, there are going to be three people that are interested in your product or your service. One of those three is going to actually result in a business opportunity. Not a sale, a business opportunity. Everybody with me on that? Okay, so 10 calls equals three interested parties equals one business opportunity. Now, there's another number that goes out beyond this 10 3 1 ratio, and that's something you've all heard, or I hope you've heard, the closing ratio. Anybody heard that? Okay. That refers to the number of quotes that you actually convert into business, right? That you actually close. An average salesperson closes at a rate of 30%. Anybody, anybody seeing a common trend? How many times is 30% showing up on, on this board? Everywhere. An average salesperson closes at 30%. And I want to talk real quickly about when I talk about averages. I'm not calling you an average person or even saying you're an average salesperson. What I'm saying is we're talking about the, the rule of averages. When you take the best salespeople and the worst salespeople, you lump them all together and you, you do the math, this is what the average is, 30%. Above average, meaning those that are classified by their companies as star performers, close at 50% or better. I don't know any of you well enough to know which category you're in. You know yourself if you're brand new. Probably don't know yet. Okay. But if you're a 30%er or you're a 50%er, you know, you, you guys can rate yourself in that regard. For purposes of our demonstration today and our conversation, we're going to assume everyone in the room is a 30%er. All right. You're closing at an average of 30%. Now, if we take these numbers out exponentially, Okay, and a very common number, most telesales organizations, their magic number always seems to be, I want you to make 100 phone calls a day. Have you ever heard that in your career? Okay. The reason that is, is they're doing the math themselves, and they're saying, okay, 100 calls is going to equal 30 interested parties. It's going to result in 10 business opportunities. And if I close at an average of 30%, how many of those quotes am I going to turn into orders? Mm, three. We'll call it three. Okay, oops, three. Okay, now we started talking earlier about our goal setting, right? And let's say we have a sales goal of 50,000. There are 22 days, well, we'll use another one. We, there's 24 days in an average month. Okay, there's actually 22 days in June. Okay, actual working days. Okay, let's call it 24 for the purposes of just a demonstration. If we break this number down, how much do we need to sell a day to get to 50,000 in 24 days. Let me do that math real quick. No? 2,084. Close. 2,084. That wasn't bad for quickening your head. OK, 
Okay, $2,084 in sales per day over an average month of 24 days to get to this number, give or take. We're rounding, we're averaging, but I think you guys get the idea. Okay, so if I want to do $2,084 in sales, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. What would you say the average sale here is, regardless of whichever group you're in? Any idea? No? Brian? What's the average ticket? Okay. Let, let's pick $500, just again for the purposes of the demonstration. It could be more, it could be less. Okay, I know in Nashville right now, we're selling to a lot of what we call mom and pops, a lot of independent restaurants and ice cream shops and bakeries and places like that. And the average sale is actually about $300. So you got to do a whole lot of those a month, okay, to get to $50,000, all right? And we do. And the average salesperson in Nashville right now does about 60 to 75 orders per month, all right? The average person, average order, okay? So again, we're talking averages here. We do $3,000 orders. We do $5,000 orders. We do $10,000 orders. We actually did a $65,000 order last month. But when you break it all down, the average ticket is about between three and $500, okay? So at an average of $500 an order, how many orders do I need to do a day to do almost $2,100 in sales? Four or five, okay? So let's, we'll use four, okay? So I'm gonna clean up this board. So if I talk to 100 people, 30 are going to be interested, 10 are going to get to quote, all right, and I'm going to close three out of those 10. Now, to hit my goal, I need to close at least, let's call it four, not three. Now, let's work this backwards, okay? If I want to close four orders a day, what do I need to do? How many quotes do I need to put out? How many interested parties do I need to have and how many people do I actually need to speak to? Can you guys can help me with this math real quick? Anybody? Well, let's, let's start from the bottom. So four, how many quotes do I need to put out if I'm closing at an average of 30%? Anybody? 12. Four times three, 30%. Carry the one, four times three. Okay. So I need to put out 12 quotes. If I'm closing at an average of 30%, I need to close, and I'm closing, and right now, then I need to do 12 quotes to wind up with four orders. If I want to get the 12 quotes, how many interested parties do I need to have? 48. Mm, no. Anybody else? 36. Everybody with me? 30%. So the ratio, the ratio is 10, 3, 1, which is basically, it's a 30% ratio. Okay? So I need to have 36 interested people to get to 12 quotes to wind up with four orders. If, I ha if I'm going to get 36 interested people, how many calls do I actually have to make? Or let me rephrase that. How many people do I actually need to speak to? There's a difference. How many people do I need to actually speak to? Anybody? <laughs> that's okay just want to wait okay so again we're talking averages all right so a hundred if I speak to not call difference again 108 people 36 are going to be interested in actually what I had to say I'm going to get to quote or send out an estimate for 12 of them and if I'm closing at an average of 30 percent I'm going to wind up with four orders and if I do that at an average of 500 per order, I'm going to hit my goal, and all I got to do is worry about doing that every day. Is everybody with me on that? So instead of worrying about, oh my gosh, how the heck am I going to do 50,000? How am I coming up with that? Focus instead on your daily goal and say, I can come in and I can write four or five orders at 500 an order and do 2,000 in sales, right? I would hope you think you can do that. You're probably in the wrong job if you don't. Okay, so focus that way. But I, what I want you to understand is this is why we drive these kinds of metrics. It's not just for no reason where we're like, you got to make 100 calls, and you got to be on the phone for three hours. And 
because we just want to keep you busy. That's not what this is about. What this is about is we know the math works and the math will be in your favor. All right. When a salesperson is not meeting their goal and is not hitting their numbers, and I look at their daily metrics, their weekly metrics, and their monthly metrics, and they're way off the mark. They're doing half what they're supposed to be doing, both in terms of calls and time. What do you think I'm going to say to that salesperson when they come in complaining that they're not hitting their numbers? Or if they're called in because they're not hitting their numbers? What advice am I going to give them? Hit, hit your daily metrics. You know, th there is, there's a method to the madness, if you will. I mean, there's a reason, like I said, that we're asking you to do what we're asking you to do. Now, we haven't talked about time yet. We're going to talk about that in a moment. There is a reason why we also want to focus on quality of calls versus just quantity of calls. You can make 300 phone calls and talk to nothing but voicemail. How many orders are you going to close that day? Okay, so it's not, like I said, just about quantity. It is also about quality. In the next session, and this is the part that most of the salespeople really like, is we're going to talk about how to get past voicemail, how to deal with all of that, how to close people more effectively, how to overcome objections more effectively. That's what the next session is all about. But before we can get to any of that, I need you to understand this stuff. So when Randy, Linda, or anybody else are like, hey, come on, guys, I need you on the phone more. I need you to make 150 phone calls a day. I need you to be on the phone for at least three hours. You understand where it's coming from. And I just firmly believe that if someone understands why they're being asked to do something, they're way more likely to do it versus just do it because I told you to. Okay? I, don't, I, I, I never responded very well to that. So I expect that no one else is going to either. So don't do it just because you're being told to. Do it because you now have a better understanding of, oh, that's why they want me to make 100 phone calls. That's why they want me to spend three hours on the phone. Now it's all making a little bit more sense. Is it? A little bit more? Yes? Did you guys already know all this stuff? Yes? No? You guys are going quiet on me. No? Okay. All right. Any questions on 1031? Any questions on closing ratio? Take a five minute break. All right, so we talked about 1031 and we talked about how sales is a numbers game. And what I want to help you with. And what I'm encouraging Randy and Linda and the other department heads to do with you, and you should start seeing this, is we actually have a daily worksheet that we give to all of the salespeople in Nashville. And it actually becomes their monthly goal sheet that they just post up at their desk and they use every day as a reminder of, hey, if I do this every day, by the end of the month, I'm going to be at my goal. So what I do each month is I sit there, we have our goal setting meeting, and I fill out this worksheet with them. And we come up with the monthly goal. And then we break it down using the 10 3 1 ratio. OK, of how many people do you need to call a day? How many people do you need to get interested? How many quotes? And how many people do you need to close? And what do you need to do as an average daily sales goal? Please understand, again, it's worth repeating it. We're talking averages and we're talking minimums. Right, if your goal is 2,000, doesn't mean you get to 2,000 and you go, whoo, got to 2,000, I'm done. And salespeople do that. All right, don't ever get off the gas. If you got two, go get four. If you got four, go get eight. Right? What I find is sales beget sales. If you're having a good day, use that positive energy, use that momentum, and go get more business. Nothing worse than a salesperson by noon who's met their daily goal and basically gives up for the day. And I've seen it happen. All right? Or I've even had people go, can I go home? I made my goal. It's beautiful outside. Can I leave? I'm like, what are you, nuts? Get on the phone and sell some more. You're having a great day. Use all of that. Use that confidence, right? Are you more confident call to call? If you had a good call, don't you feel great when you make the next call, right? Versus if you have a bad call, a person hangs up on you, is rude to you. You don't even want to make that next phone call, right? You got to shake it off and oh, I got to go get some air. You know, you got to get back in your game mode before you can even get back on the next call. When you're having a good day and things seem to be going your way, Use that to your advantage, please. Don't ever let off the gas. I say that in Nashville all the time. And it makes a difference. And, you know, they were so happy when they were just getting to their daily goal that I immediately saw them go into coast mode. And that's when I was right back in there going, no, 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 no. 
keep going, keep going, you're doing great. And sure enough, those $2,000 days turn into $3,000 days, those $3,000 days turn into $5,000 days. That's how you build momentum. We talked about the metrics and how the whole 1031 works and why it's important to you. Does everyone now see how you can use them to benefit you? Because if not, I want to spend a little bit more time on it. Does everybody get it? The way you're going to use it is through this daily sheet that I'm talking about. Again, when I sit with the salespeople, we go over all of this and we say, okay, here's your roadmap. Every day that you come in, here's what you're hoping to achieve. And what's really nice for me is then they, they start to self-govern and almost self-police themselves. Because they know when they didn't make the number of calls they should have made. They know when they didn't make the number of sales they should have made. And they know when they didn't hit the number they, they should have made. You follow? Whereas if all you're doing is looking at this big old $50,000 goal, what happens? People go, well, I just had a bad day. I'll do better tomorrow. Tomorrow turns into next week. Next week turns into next month. Right? And here's the other thing that's, that happens here. If I wait until the end of the month to sit down with you and go, hey, what happened? You didn't hit your number. What am I going to do to change it? nothing. It's too late. Month is over. If I look at it daily with you, if you're looking at it daily, if we sit down and review it weekly, if you're off track, if you're not hitting your daily metrics, or you know, let's take this a different way. Let's say you are hitting your daily metrics, but you're still not getting the sales results. Then maybe we need to look at changing something up. Maybe we need to get you in front of different customers, more customers. Maybe for whatever reason in the particular space or area that you're in, you need to talk to 200 people a day, not 100. But you see what I mean? We start to fine tune it and tweak it and we find out what works for you. If I wait until June 30th to go, hey, you didn't hit your 50, all I can do is hope you have a better July. And guess what? My flux capacitor doesn't work. My DeLorean's on the fritz and I can't go back in time. It took a little while. Everybody was like, what are you talking about, dude? Okay. Back to the future. Everybody with me? Okay. I can't go back in time, okay, and fix the problem. So I prefer to deal with it daily, weekly, monthly. And I would suggest that you do the same. So... I can give everybody a copy of that sheet. Randy and Linda have it. Okay, and you guys can fill it out for yourselves. If they give you a sales goal of 40 grand, 50 grand, 20 grand, whatever it is, fill it out. And say, okay, if I want to hit that goal, or better yet, if I want to exceed that goal, what do I need to do today, tomorrow, and the next day? That will also help you with something that salespeople really struggle with, and that is consistency. How many of you have had a great month, and then the very next month had one of your worst months? That hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. And you know why that is? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Honestly? Yeah. Not always, but the large percentage of the time, the reason that happens is because you've met your number, you let out a big old sigh of relief, and you take your foot off the gas. Okay? And then it's a week plus into the new month when you wake up and you go, oh, my God, i got to actually have a good this July, too. I can't just bank on the fact that I had a good June. And sometimes by then it's a little too late. Some people recover. Some people actually like that extra pressure. I don't know why you want to do that to yourself, but some people seem to like it. Some people seem to even thrive in it. Sales is hard enough. Okay, well, let's get philosophical. Life is hard enough. Why make it harder? That I don't understand. Okay, if you know that just by coming in every day and doing a few basic things, it's going to have a direct and a profound impact on the number that you're trying to hit, why wouldn't you do it? Why would you wait to the third week out of the four, out of four to go to scramble and try and play catch up to make your number so you're not sitting in you know Shannon, Randy, or Linda's office being talked to, right? Doesn't that make more sense? You know, if I'm going to get pulled into somebody's office, I want it to be for a pat on the back. Hey, great job, man! You blew that number out of the water. That was great. Okay, those are the meetings I like to have. Don't always get to have as often as we'd like, but those are the meetings that I like to have. Okay, everybody with me on this? Any questions at all on the 1031 metric? Because it's crucial. No? Everybody's with me? Okay. Let's talk about every salesperson's favorite subject in the world time management. How many of you in this room will admit you struggle with time management? I should see everyone's hand. You're all liars. No? You guys are masters of time management? Yeah? Not masters. You are? <coughs> okay. We're going to call. What? <laughs> you don't say, oh, okay, well, that's. All right, here's the, thing. here's the thing with time management. Again, we talked about the very beginning of this that as salespeople, typical and average salespeople, you're really good at certain things. By nature, it tends to make you really bad at other things. Those other things happen to be 
these time management and organizational skills. Again, you're artistic, you're flowery, you like to talk, you know, just let me go do my thing. You, you don't want to sit there and dot I's, cross T's. You don't want to deal with numbers. You don't want to deal with reports. I, I think we can all agree. You for sure, apparently. Because they're all picking on you, so I'm going to jump right in. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, here's the reality. is It's nothing to actually be ashamed of. You know, they always say that the first step to recovery is admit you have a problem. Okay, nobody's ever heard that? Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a sales rehab, everybody. That's what this is. It's an intervention, okay? You have to admit that you have the problem, and then you can fix it. And there are some really, really, really easy things that you can do to fix it, and we're going to talk about that right now. We've already talked a little bit about this, but we're going to talk a little more about it, and that is have a goal. I'm not talking about your sales goal. I'm not talking about that new house, boat, or car you want to buy. What I'm talking about is a daily goal. Part of your daily goal, yes, is the number and is the metrics. But within the number and those metrics, there's actually the nuts and bolts of what you're going to do that day. Who am I going to call? When am I going to call them? Right? What other tasks do I need to complete that day? Do I have orders to follow up on, jobs to follow up on? Do I have you know, a meeting to go to? What does my day look like? How many of you, and again, this is an intervention, so we're going to admit when we have a problem, how many of you show up to work in the morning with no clue what you're going to do that day? A few people. <laughs> no clue. No, no, no. And hang on, let me, you have a general idea that I'm going to come in, I'm going to answer the phone, I'm going to make some calls, and I'm going to hopefully sell some stuff. So you have a general clue. But how many of you have an actual plan of when I get in, this is what I'm going to do, and by the time I leave, I want to make sure I've accomplished A, B, C, D, and E. No. Uh, I say that. that can I say, I can I say, say it, it, does not, it does not always work that way. Yeah. But sometimes you can come in with a plan of what you need to do and what you're going to do, exactly. and then one thing can throw that whole day off. Thank you, for, thank you for saying that. But hang on. Here's the reality of why that is. You're letting the day control you. You're not controlling your day. And I don't know. I know stuff. Trust me. I'm the king of stuff happening. Well, okay, but hey, hey, hey. Sometimes it's because of what other people need from you. Sure. That day because as, as a customer service or admin, mm -hmm. your day is, is set. And then your salesperson needs something totally different from you that day, which is going to throw your whole goal. So if you know that's going to happen every day, why wouldn't you plan it for it? Well, why don't you plan that it will? <laughs> <laughs> why not plan for it to happen every day? And then when it doesn't happen on a particular day, you have even more time to do other things. No? Not well, buying it? He doesn't have that two-hour time slot to add in there. Well, so let, let roll, roll with me here. Let's, let's talk <laughs> about this. No, 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 it's, but it's good stuff. Uh, let's, let's talk about it. Y y here's the thing. that You've heard the term best laid plans. Mm -hmm. Okay. you got to have a plan. Does it mean you're always going to be 100% able to stick to it? No. Who in the room has kids? Okay, you make all kinds of plans. Do they always happen the way you expect them to happen? No. Right, what do you do? You compromise, you adjust, you beat them, you do whatever. No, you don't do that. You do <laughs> okay, you, you do what you have to do to make an adjustment, okay? But you have to have a plan, okay? In sales, you have got to, got to, got to plan your day or else your day will absolutely take control of you. Stuff does come up. Stuff does happen. Stuff you didn't expect. And even stuff that you should have expected, but still get blindsided by it. Okay, what I'm saying is structure your day and have a plan. I'm going to tell you a qu really quick story. I have a really good friend of mine, who lives in California still. He's in the mortgage business. We all have heard what's going on in the mortgage business. Yes. Yeah. Okay. To this day, he still makes over a million dollars a year, even with everything that's going on in the economy. He is what I would consider to be a machine. Okay. This guy has found what works, and he does it over and over and over and over again. Okay, And he doesn't falter from it. He just doesn't. Now, he's what most people would consider to be anal retentive okay, in terms of how he structures things and how he plans things, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. The story, and what's really kind of funny, is that every single new person that's hired at that mortgage company is required to spend one of their training days sitting with this guy. His name is Scott. Okay? And they sit this guy right next to Scott. And the first question they ask Scott is what? Any idea? 
Well, they already know because they advertise it to everybody. Huh? Exactly. How do you do that? Okay? You know, anybody see Pursuit of Happiness? Okay? All I want to know is what do you do and where do you do it or whatever? Because, I mean, you, you can't help but ask a guy who's been that successful, how, how do you do it? He gives every single person the same answer. He says a couple things. One, I am disciplined, okay, and I am consistent. I figured out what worked a long time ago, and I do not deviate from it. That's the first tip he gives them. The second one, and this is the one that everyone kind of laughs at and goes, that can't be that easy. He said, I run my whole life off of a to-do list. That's it. He goes, I do not end my day without an entire plan for what I am going to do tomorrow. And he goes, that has kept me on track, and it has kept me successful, and is the reason that I have made the money that I have made. Okay? He tells every single recruit that, and you know how many people actually go back to their desk and do a to-do list? Less than 1%. Think about that. Here's a guy who's making, set, not six, seven figures a year consistently for the last seven years. And you ask him his advice, he gives it to you, and you go back to your desk and ignore it. Does that make a whole lot of sense? No, that makes sense. Well, that's the difference between the successful and the unsuccessful. I mean, the, the successful people, they know what to do, and more importantly, they, they actually do it. Right? How many people, they can read every self-help book and every sales book, and they can sit in on every sales training in the world. If we sit here for the next six hours with each other over the next two days, but you go back to your desk and implement none of this, Yes, six hours. Sorry to scare you. Okay? If, yeah, it's like, whoa, that's a long time. Um, and if you don't use any of it, who's that on? Is that on me or is that on you? That's on you. Okay? What's even funnier is that at the end of that day, every one of those new recruits is required to go meet with the sales manager, and the sales manager does a quick debrief. You know, how was your day with Scott? Almost every single person goes, oh, my God, that was the most boring eight hours I've ever spent in my life. And the sales manager's already laughing because he knows what he's going to say. And he's like, well, why would you say that? He's like, I sat there for eight hours. He made over 100 phone calls, and he said the same darn thing <laughs> on every single call. It was like listening to a recording. And the sales manager sits back in his chair and goes, dummy, that's the whole idea. That's the point. Do that, and you could be as successful financially as he has been. Everybody gauges you know, success differently. So, okay, but... And, and a lot of people just simply don't get it, but that is the idea. Can, the discipline and the time management, we're going to spend more time talking about, but more importantly, the consistency and that discipline of doing it every single day is the difference between success and failure, real success and failure. Everybody can have a good day. Everybody can have a good week. Everybody can have a real good month even. But can you put 12 of those together? Can you have 12 great months? Can you be the top performer every month out of every year? You know, can you be the top performer even at the end of the year, right? You've all heard of every squirrel finds a nut or whatever. I mean, everybody can get lucky, you know. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with luck, okay? We, we really, really like luck in sales, right? But you've also all heard that luck is where hard work and opportunity meet. I got all kinds of cliches. I can throw them out all day, okay? But it's true. If you put yourself in the right place and you're there at the right time and you position yourself properly by working hard and so on, you will absolutely reap the benefit. That is, and I want to make this statement, that is the beautiful thing to me about sales. There are very few professions that you can get out of it directly what you put into it. Think about that. If you come into work and you phone it in that day, you know, as well as I do, it's going to have an effect on whether you do or don't sell that day or how much you do sell, right? Whereas if you come in and you're really on your A game and you're really pushing it and you're really doing it, you can see a direct and an immediate impact on that effort. Right? How many people go to work every day, and no matter whether they work hard, or they work not so hard, or they kill themselves, how, it just doesn't even make a difference. Think about that. Okay, there are a lot of people that go to work every day. That's like they do. A guy working on an assembly line. Oh, I screwed this one better than that one. How, how, how is he going to know? Okay, so you have, you have the really nice thing of being a salesperson where you can come in every day and say, hey, if I work really hard, I'm going to see a direct impact on what? Huh? Right, okay. That's that's a more PC answer. I was going to say your paycheck, but that's a more PC answer. Okay, he said the success however you define it. So that was good. I'll use that in the future. Okay. Uh, everybody, everybody understand that so far? I mean, conceptually, everybody kind of with me there? All right. So again, when we talk about having a goal, what I am talking about is do a to-do list. 
do not leave the office tonight without a plan for what you're going to do tomorrow. Please. Pretty please. Okay? Even you admin. Right? Have a plan for tomorrow. Will things affect that plan? Yes, I think we've already determined that. Okay? Will things always go the way you want them to go? Heck no. But guess what? Your plan should also build in the variable of the fact that it's not always going to go the way I want. I better leave myself a little bit of a cushion. My friend Scott actually writes down when he's going to go to the bathroom. Oh, my friend Scott. He's a little nuts, but he's all right. <laughs> like, feet is my bathroom break. I got to go. Huh? Yeah, he's, he's gone. He's gone. I don't know. He's, exactly. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's a little nuts. <laughs> all right. So have the goal for your day. What having a goal will do and having a to-do list. And, and just again, real quickly, salespeople. And let, let's talk about this for a moment. How many of you come in in the morning and, and whatever, you get to your desk, we'll leave out the coffee and the Danish and all the other stuff you probably do before you actually make it to your desk. I know you can't eat at your desk, so you're in the break room chit-chatting with your buddies and having your coffee and having your whatever. You finally make it to your desk. Okay, and by the way, I've been asked to make this statement. This isn't me because I'm don't. i not here, okay? <laughs> when do you guys start work? Nine when do you all make it to your desk? <laughs> Who said nine? You guys said nine? Okay. All right. Here, here's the thing, and this is I, I, I'm saying this not only on behalf of other people, but I am just saying this as a just a good. It's always good advice. If you're supposed to be at your desk working by nine, and you want to do other things when you get here, logic would tell you what get here a bit earlier. Okay, and go enjoy your cup of coffee and your Danish in the break room, chat with your buddies, and then be at your work work be at your desk working at nine. If you first get here at 9, you run to your desk, you log in at Hagen, and then go to the break room to get your cup of coffee in Danish, not cool. Okay? And I'll leave it at that. All right? What the company expects is that you're at your desk, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, when you clock in, and when you get here. If you have a to-do list, what you're not going to do, and this is what I see salespeople do all the time, I call it, we'll call it Hagen surfing. Okay? But I used to call it contact management surfing. Fire up Hagen. You can hopefully you have some reminders set for yourself, right? Some people you need to call, people you're supposed to follow up on. You might just surf down that list and go, eh, I don't want to call that guy. Oh, that person's really mean. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, they always hang up on me. You know, so you start going down the list and you start making decisions on who you are and who you aren't going to call. Some people take it a step further. They ignore their, you know, callbacks, if you will, or not only their callbacks, but their reminders. They then start going through Hagen and just kind of clicking through their contacts, doing the same darn thing. Ooh, Betty's really nice. I'm going to call Betty. Boop pick up the phone, you call Betty. Okay, you just avoided the 15 other harder phone calls because you didn't want to deal with the rejection, you didn't want to talk to the person, you're not ready yet, your coffee hasn't kicked in, whatever your reasons or your rationale are. That is a colossal. Forget about all the implications on you not making the hard phone call. We'll talk about those tomorrow, but it's a colossal waste of time. If you have a plan, if you have a call sheet, it's not enough just to have your to-do list. Make sure you have reminders set for yourself. Make sure you have a clear list of these are the people that I need to call tomorrow. So when I come in and I get at my desk and I get logged in and I get myself situated, I'm in my comfy chair, right, and I'm all good, you pick up the phone and you start dialing. What I suggest that you do is you really structure your day. And we do something in Nashville, um, and some people poke fun at it a little bit, okay, but we, I've structured literally their whole day. When they come in in the morning, for the first half an hour to an hour, it depends on the person or the circumstance, their focus is on some of their administrative tasks. Check their email, clean up and respond to the emails, you know, delegate certain tasks, clean certain things up, follow up on a few things, maybe return a couple phone calls I didn't get to the end of yesterday, whatever. Okay? From we have people that get in at eight. So those people do that from eight to nine. From nine to ten thirty, those people then are in what we call hammer time. Okay, and that is nothing but outbound phone calls. No administrative work, no distractions, no disruptions. Every other department in the office knows it's hammer time. They're not at the person's desk going, hey, hey, I need your help with this. Or, hey, hey, can you answer this? Or, hey, they know it's hammer time. Leave them alone. All right. They're expected within that, over that hour and a half to make as many productive outbound phone calls as possible. I will stand here and admit to you, does it always happen? No. Do the salespeople in Nashville 
every single day as much as I push them hit their metrics every single day? No, because I'm still dealing with people. Okay, but that is the goal and that is the focus. They really enjoy it because it gives their day structure. They're not left to just go, well, let me see, let me figure it out. Uh, they know, okay, from 8 to 9, I'm doing this, this, and this. That's what Peter expects. That's what I'm supposed to be doing, and they do it. They know from 9 to 10.30, I'm supposed to be on the phone making as many outbound phone calls as I can. After 10.30, and they typically take lunch, for example, at 11.30, that gives them a solid another hour to make sure that the orders and jobs they just took get processed because they have sales admins just like, you know, you do here, to follow up on things, to answer voicemails that they might have got while they were in hammer time, you know, go to the bathroom or, you know, do whatever else that they need to do. But I ask them, give me that hour and a half in the morning and give me that hour and we do it again in the afternoon for an hour and a half. The average worker works between seven and eight hours with their break for lunch. I'm only asking for three hours out of that seven or eight hours to be dedicated to the actual task that you've been hired to do. Think about that for a second. Right? And here you're at being asked for three to four. Okay, so you're here seven or eight hours, and the company is saying to you, just at least give me 40 or 50 percent of the time that you're here dedicated to what I hired you to do. And yet salespeople fight it tooth and nail. Well, I'm busy doing this, and I got to do that. And if I'm making outbound phone calls, then I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't follow up on my orders, and I can't. We're going to talk about that. But yes, you can. Okay? It starts with this. Have a structure to your day. Have the to-do list. Control your day. Do not let your day control you. I can't say it any more plainly than that. And it's easy to say. I'm not saying it's always as easy to do. But you have got to got to try and take control of it. The best way, like I said, is the, the, the to-do list. Give yourself a structure to your day. If Randy, Linda, or anybody else don't come to you and say, okay, here's how it's going to work. You're going to have hammer time. You're going to have hammer time. Why do you need them to tell you to do it? You with me? Why do you need them to tell you to do it? It's your day. It's your sales. It's your pocket. It's your money. Do it. You know, block the world out and say, hey, leave me alone from nine, you know, nine to nine thirty or nine to ten thirty or whatever. This is what I'm going to be doing. Watch your call numbers go through the roof. And not only your numbers go through the roof, watch your sales increase. I sat down with two of my salespeople last week. One of them was fairly consistently between two and a half and three hours a day on the phone almost three hours every single day. She was doing two times the number of sales as the other person that I had in the room with me. How many calls was that person making? Anybody? Nearly half as much. And that wasn't a coincidence. Okay, so the one salesperson was making nearly, spending nearly half the time on the phone, making nearly half the number of phone calls, and had produced nearly half the amount of sales. Is that a coincidence? Okay. So there was no better illustration that I could give for her to say, look, you know, because she's a very competitive person. I knew that would get her juices going. I said, here's a person right here who's doing nearly three hours every single day consistently. They're outpacing you two to one. You're not? Go ahead. Sorry, excuse me. Are you talking about three hours of call time or three hours in a day? Three hours of call time in a day. Yeah, three hours in a day. Not, what would, not three hours for the week. Yeah. Well, no. It, see, I look at outbound as different than inbound. Okay, we, you know, I would hope that you're developing a clientele, you're developing a book of business, and hopefully you've got people who do actually call you. If you're just starting out, 90% of what you're doing is going to be outbound, right? You don't have customers yet. You don't have people calling you up. They don't have pe you don't have people reordering from you and stuff yet. So you're doing 90% outbound. So people are at different stages in their career. If I'm dealing with a rookie, somebody who's just been on the phone for a week, I want to see three, four, five hours of just outbound calling. If you happen to get a couple inbound calls, great. All right? I'm sorry. No, okay. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Are, yeah. you, are you saying, like, in a day, you could say, give me three hours of calling from 9, 10, 11, 12, three right. hours, or three hours of call time, which would make you take eight hours. Do you understand what oh, I see what you're saying. It's, it's three hours out of an eight-hour day. <laughs> okay. It is. Three it's hours, not three correct. hours of call time. And we, okay. Right. And we break it up into two areas. We say, give me an hour and a half dedicated in the morning. Give me an hour and a half dedicated in the afternoon. That doesn't mean that I hope the maximum you do is three hours out of an eight-hour day. What I'm basically saying is give me that at least as a minimum. You know, I don't think it's out of line for me to ask to get three out of eight hours dedicated to, like I said, the thing that I hired you to do 
and that's call and touch as many customers as possible. That, that's what we're really talking about. Now, you're going to have other reasons that you're on the phone. You're going to have follow-up stuff. You're going to have all that kind of stuff that should add to your call time. Now, if you're only doing two and a half, three hours all-encompassing in call time, then you're probably not talking to enough customers. And what we're going to talk about in the next section is how to actually, well, one, get people on the phone. And then two, once you have them on the phone, keep them on the phone for more than a minute. Okay, that's what we're going to really talk about in the next section. Okay, because I, lo I look at the call reports and I see straight across the board average call times of anywhere from a minute to a minute and a half. And what that tells me is that it's a very brief conversation or it's simply just voicemail. Okay, either one of those is not going to get you a sale. Right, you can't sell to a machine. All right, so we'll talk a lot about, about that, like I said, you know, in the next section. Okay, everyone with me on to-do lists? Now, statistically, 90% of you are going to go back to your desk and you're not going to do a to-do list. I know that. Okay, I'm going to suggest that you not be typical, that you not be that person that goes back to your desk and ignores everything that we just talked about, that you do a to-do list. It was really cool for me the day after we did this first part of training, I walked through the sales room and people were holding up their to-do list. Look, look, I got it, I got it. Now, whether they kept doing it after I left, I don't know. But again, that's on them. You have to make your own choice. Do I want to be successful or do I not want to be successful? Do I want to make more? Do I want to make less? Right? I can't make that decision for you. You have to make that decision for yourself. All right. So we have a structure to our day. Okay. We have a goal of what we want to achieve in that day. And we're going to take control of our day. And we're not going to let it take control of us. Right? Everybody going to make me that promise? You guys aren't selling it. No? Yes? Okay. All right. Naps, that was better. Who said that? Yeah. There you go. Okay. All right. Let's talk about another thing that I find salespeople really struggle with, and that's delegating. Ah, sales admins always perk up when we talk about this. Ooh, ah, delegating. Okay. Here's the big question, and you need to ask this question of yourself every day with nearly every task. Do I delegate it or do I do it myself? Okay, and we're going to talk about, we're going to define that right now. Okay, any good organizational coach will tell you that it is imperative that you categorize your daily tasks. If you ever have gone to a, either a seminar or even to one of their stores, Stephen Covey, okay, I've been all that stuff, all right, and there's some good things that you can take out of it. Some of it's just nonsense, okay, but there's some good stuff that you can take out of a lot of those things. The one thing I really liked about their program is they really force you to categorize your, and prioritize your tasks. Is it an A, is it a B, is it a C, is it a D? They then also further take it, they take it one step further and they say, make it, is it a personal task or is it a business task? And then is it, a, is it a business one, is it a business, you know, and you really prioritize it. So instead of just looking at a whole list of stuff on a piece of paper that when you look at it the next day may not make a whole lot of sense because you're like, okay, well, what's more important? Should I do this first or should I do this first? They really talk about prioritizing each and every one of those tasks, and I really like that, and I really suggest that. If you're not going to prioritize it, at least categorize it and say, this is a money-making task or it is not. If you are a salesperson, if there's a task that isn't going to directly put money in yours and the company's pocket, it's just not that important. Everybody follow what I just said? If it's not going to put money directly in yours and the company's pocket, it's just not that important. I'm not saying it doesn't need to get done. I'm saying it's not a priority. What is a priority is doing things that are going to make you and the company money. And those things are being on the phone with customers, booking jobs and orders. Right? Why does the company hire sales admins? So the sales rep can delegate a task What are you, my straight man? What was that? <laughs> See, I'll learn my lesson. I'll ask that question before I actually give you the answer. <laughs> yeah, the, the bottom line is, and everything that was said is correct, the bottom line is we hire sales admins so that salespeople can focus on what they've been hired to do, and that is sell. Okay? The administrative work that comes with selling is a necessary evil. When we book an order, something's got to be done with it, right? It's got to be loaded into Hagen, and boy, that's fun, right? Okay, we got we got to get 
all the new people know what I mean by that. Hagen's a bit of a bear when you first start, okay? So getting the order or the job in Hagen, getting it over to pre-press, right? Getting it to the art department, getting it to, there's a whole lot of things that happen after you do your job and actually take in the order. The reason we have a pre-press department, an art department, which is basically the same thing, production and sales admins and accounting and warehousing and all these other departments is so that you don't have to do those things. Yet it amazes me. I sit down with salespeople all the time. And when I ask them, why aren't you hitting your numbers? Well, I had to go check on this. And I had to go check on that. And I had to do this. And I had to do that. And I'm like, what the heck am I paying your sales admin for? Well, you see, it was kind of complicated. And I figured it would just be easier if I did it myself. Oh, so now your sales admin's stupid. Well, no, that's not what I meant. Well, then what do you mean? Okay, you guys with me on this? This is what salespeople do. They will find almost any excuse to not do what they're supposed to do. I don't know why that is, but it's true. Okay? Don't look for excuses not to do what you do. You have resources. You have sales admins. You have all these other people that can help you. What you need to decide, is this something that I'm going to do myself, or can I delegate this? Here's the rule. If it's going to take you less than a couple of minutes to do it, or... It's a direct revenue generating activity. Do it yourself. I love this. How many times have you walked over to your admin or typed a four page email to your admin explaining to them something that would have taken you a minute to do yourself? How many times have you done it? Be honest. Why? Now, if the sales admin is new or it's you're new in terms of working with that sales admin and it's a learning opportunity, where you have to, it's like, hey, this is the first time I'm asking you to do this, and I kind of need to explain it so in the future you know how to do it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about simple daily tasks where instead of just saying, here, I need you to do this, or you just simply doing it yourself, you'll sit there and, hey, I don't have to make calls for the next 10 minutes because I'm going to sit here and artfully craft this email to my sales admin. All right, And then when Randy or Linda come by my desk and go, why aren't you making phone calls? Well, I got this big thing I'm working on, and I got to send this email to so-and-so. Come on. I was born at night, but not last night. Okay? That's not what you should be doing. Okay? If it takes less than a couple of minutes, do it yourself. If it's a direct revenue generating task, do it yourself. Delegating, and there's also something that I love to call dumping. They're two different things. Salespeople are really good at dumping. Okay? Dumping to me is basically everything and anything that you don't feel like doing going, here, you do this. I don't want to fill this report out. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to make that phone call. That person's mean. Here, you call them. Okay, that's dumping. Okay, and I am sure that at one time or another, you've been guilty of dumping. Okay, don't dump. Delegating is when you simply take something that would take you more than a few minutes to do or is not a direct revenue generating task. It's an administrative task, true and genuine, that you say, here, I need your help with you do that so I can go over here and go make another sale. Entering orders and jobs into Hagen, perfect example. I get really upset when my salespeople enter orders and jobs into Hagen. Really upset. Because that's not what I'm paying them to do. That's what I'm paying a sales admin to do. Okay? Everyone has their role. Everyone has their job. You know, I use analogies that we talk about like making a movie. Now, it might be the actor in front of the, in front of the camera who's getting all the glory and getting the big old check. But guess what? That movie doesn't get made unless there's what? Director, producer, the cinematographer, the sound guy, right? Sound guy? Right? Camera guy? You know, none of this happens without all of those other people. Everyone has their role and everyone has to be comfortable in their role. If you want to be in the limelight and you want to be on the front lines and you want to have the stress and the pressure of having to make a number every month and making commissions, be a salesperson. Okay? If you don't want that stress and you don't want that pressure and you don't want to be in the limelight and you prefer to do the detail work and the administrative work, then you're a sales admin. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, a lot of sales admins start as sales admins so they can become salespeople. Some sales admins are sales admins because that's what they want to be. They have no desire to be salespeople. I actually like those because I hate when I lose a good sales admin to be wanting to be a salesperson. Okay, because then you've got to retrain somebody new. Okay. Empower the sales admins to do the job they were hired to do and stop using it as a crutch and an excuse to not do what you were hired to do. Does that make sense to everybody? If you honestly 
sincerely believe that your sales admin is not capable of doing what you need them to do, then you need to go have that conversation with someone. But I would argue that probably 99.9% .9 of the time, that's not the case and that's not the problem. I'm not saying it's never happened, okay? But it's typically whereas you're just using it as either a crutch or an excuse. I, the last training I did, and it was funny, I had sales admins going, I sit around sometimes looking for stuff to do. Yet my salesperson's over there saying, I'm busy as a one hour man in a fight, you know, I can't do this and I can't do that. And the sales admin's like, what? I've been in Nashville too long. You see what happened there? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, but you get my point? Is everybody understanding? Yes? Okay. Do the job that you were hired to do. Everybody. Okay? Do the job that you were hired to do. Delegate, don't dump. Okay? And there's another thing called relegate. Everybody know what relegating is? What's relegate? Anybody? Did everybody hear that? Relegating is when you basically move a task to another time. You reprioritize it or you prioritize it as something that, hey, that can wait. I can do that later. I'm not going to do it during hammer time because I should be on the phone calling customers. Okay, I'm not going to do it in my prime calling hours when I could be making money. I'll do that at the end of the day or maybe I'll even do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll even do it next week. Okay, I'm not saying procrastinate. Another good thing salespeople are really, really good at. What I'm saying is prioritize, categorize, and figure out what actually makes sense to do then and what will make sense to do later. Okay, relegation is really, really important. And for some reason, I think salespeople struggle with that even more than delegating. Oh, I got to do this now. No, no, you don't. It can wait. Do it later. What you need to do now is get on the phone and sell something. That's what you need to do now. All that other stuff can wait. And I make myself available, you know, to everybody too. Hey, you need help with something. I'm here to help. You know, let's get it done. The most important thing that we can do as a sales organization or sales group is sell. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. We talked already a lot about this, but I want to visit it again real quickly. And it's consistency coupled with time management. When you take some of these very simple tips, and, and guys, by the way, I'm not suggesting for one second that any of this is rocket science or that I've reinvented the wheel in any way. Okay, this is pretty simple stuff. What happens is, like I said a couple times now, is most people don't take it and don't use it. And that's why they don't get the result. And they go, oh, that training was a waste of time. My sales haven't gone up one bit. Are you doing any of this? You know, are, did you start a to-do list? Are you, are you following some of these time management practices? Are you delegating and are you relegating? And when we get to the stuff tomorrow and we really start talking about really the hands-on stuff of selling and improving your customer relations and all that, if you're not doing any of that, then I can guarantee you you're not going to see any results. Okay? So the, what's on you guys is really seriously about the consistency. Find what works and do it. What I'm suggesting is I've already proved, not only for myself, but for a lot of people that I've managed, hired, trained, that this stuff works. Give it a shot. Okay? Do it. If it's not bringing you results, then let's talk about it. Okay? I had one person who called me, and you guys all know Abby. Okay. She was one of the first people that called me and said, I tried this and it worked. And then she tried something else and it didn't work so well for her. So she called me again and she's like, hey, I tried this and it didn't really work. We talked about it. I helped her tweak it and fine tune it a little bit. She went right back at it. She's tenacious. I like that about her. She went right back at it, called me back the next day, said, holy crap, it worked. So sometimes every, you know, everyone's got their own unique delivery, their style, the way they talk, the way whatever. So sometimes they need to be fine tuned a little bit. That's okay. Huh? Abby is? Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk uh, a couple of fun science-based facts, as I call it. Here's a couple of realities that you need to kind of embrace really, really early on. The reality is this. People love to buy but hate to be sold. Everybody get that? People love to buy. We are a consumer-driven society. We shop as an activity. Okay, what are you going to do today? I'm going shopping. Right? What? Not you? No? Oh, I do. Okay, so it, we are a very consumer driven society. Okay, we shop. Okay, but here's the funny thing how many of you walked into Best Buy, pick a store, you walk in, the clerk going, hey, can I help you today? No, just looking. But you're in the store to buy something, aren't you? But your immediate reaction is, no, 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 just looking, leave me alone, get away. Right? Why is that? Because. <laughs> 
Instinct. Okay, you know who said that? Okay, I'm glad you said it because guess what? But that's the answer. How do you know that your salespeople aren't being perceived the same way when they call to you? They probably are, and I guarantee you they are actually. Okay, so no offense, sales. Okay. No, but because here's because here's why. I've been using this word very liberally today and, and a lot in general selling. What we're going to talk about in the next session is guess what? I don't sell ever. I don't sell. And we'll talk about that. I'm going to leave that one out there. We'll talk about it in the next session. And I do not sell. Why? Because I know what I just said. People hate to be sold. So if I approach everyone as, hi, I'm Joe Salesman, and I'd like to sell you something today, which I could do, what do I do? I immediately put the person on the defensive. They immediately put their guard up, and I get the immediate just looking. When you call a customer on the phone and you say, hi, my name is, I'm your new account manager or your sales rep over at PLI, what response do you get? Oh, I want to sign your name. Thank you. That's the equivalent of, I'm just looking. You with me? And that's what we're going to talk about, how to avoid all that nonsense tomorrow, because that's what's killing you guys. Oh, now I got you all riled up. <laughs> to be continued. All right. Okay, so here's the other thing. We're coming back. I know. It's not like we're going to come back. I can tell you now. <laughs> Cheaters. That's right. All right. Here's the other reality. People buy from people they like. <laughs> Usually. There's always exceptions to rules. You're right. Get like. Yes. I am. I am. I am. Not only do people buy from people they like, they buy from people they Right. How many people in your world do you trust that you do not like? Do you trust a lot of people you don't like? Yeah. Really? Why? Really? A lot of people will buy from you because... No, no, no. I'm not talking about sales buying. I'm no, just talking about... A lot of people will buy stuff from you because they trust you, but not necessarily because they like you. Because I talk to people that I don't like. <laughs> okay. I really do. There's always one. People will buy from people. They trust them more than they like them. Because have you not ever talked to somebody and, and just listened to what they had to say just because what they were saying was something you really wanted to hear and you trusted what they were saying? Not necessarily because you like that individual. Okay. You're, you're taking like a little too literally. It, there, I, I'm not hey, – yeah, exactly. It's, it's more, here's the thing. You have, to div you have to get to some level of common ground and rapport with someone to get to trust. There's no other way. When I say like – I'm not talking, hey, let's go grab lunch, dinner, or a cup of coffee together, like. I'm talking about, all right, I don't hate this guy, and I'm at least going to listen to what he has to say. That, when we, that's what we're talking about like. That's what we're talking about. Is, there, is everybody with me on that? Okay, but I will say this, and I want to actually, in defense of what she was saying, I have seen salespeople be the most obnoxious, rude, ruthless people and book business like mad. You know why? Because what they were was persistent and persistent. Okay? And some people just said, look, man, I'm going to give you the orders to get you off my back. Okay? That's a, that's a matter of choice. You want to be that guy or girl? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm suggesting you don't need to be that person to achieve the same result. And you can get people to like you. I'll put that in quotes. Okay? And want to buy from you. Okay? If you don't get to a level of some kind of understanding and rapport and common ground, you're not going to get to the word go. You're not going to get to give your pitch. You're not going to get to give any of that. So you made a, you made a judgment at some point going, all right, I don't hate this guy enough to, you know, I'll listen to him. That's what I'm talking about, okay? A couple of things, right? You'll have this notes, but you might want to write this down too. This is a good one that I want to make sure you really remember. It's the rule of yeses. Anybody ever heard of that before? You have? Good. Okay. Women in the room, what's the easiest way to get the answer you want? Beg. Who said beg? Who are we talking to? Huh? Yeah, no, where, yeah. What's. To ask it with a person that makes you feel No, I'm not talking closed ended open end questions. That's a whole other thing we'll talk about. But you, you got, you, you're born with this. So every woman does it. Every woman I've ever known does it. You ask questions you already know the answers to. Oh, now they'll be like, oh, yeah, I do that all the time. 
<laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you were talking about that. Yeah. You ask questions, you already know the answer. I'm not saying guys don't ever do it, but for whatever reason, they don't most know. women don't. Yeah. Oh, you got it. We're not quick enough. Great. So. I have three brothers. Trust me. They, they do, do it? Work. Okay, good. I mean, I know I do it, but. Every man does it. Every man does it? Yeah. Every man does it. Do you do that? I do now because I have a couple days. Ah, there you go. Okay. The rule of yeses is, is this. If you get a customer or a prospect or a lead to say five yeses to you or more in the course of a conversation, you are statistically more likely to get to a sale. Everyone with me on that? And it's really simple, and we'll spend more time on it in the next section. And I use this analogy all the time. It gets me in trouble sometimes. Man walks into a bar, walks up to a woman, and says, can I buy you a drink? She says, no, that's okay, I don't want a drink. Well, how about you want to go dance? No, I don't want to really dance. The guy's real crazy, takes the next leap of faith and says, well, how about we go home together? And she says, uh, did you not hear me the first two times? I said no and no. Now, there are some women out there who might have said yes and gone, but that's a whole other story. Okay? Okay, that's, that's a whole other conversation. If you think of that analogy, though, that is what most salespeople do every single sales call they make. They ask a bunch of questions or they make a bunch of requests. They get no, 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 and then they go, what do I got to do to sell you? So they're asking for the final yes, which is the close, after receiving nothing but no's. How likely is it you're going to get to this yes after receiving all kinds of negative responses in the first place? It's very unlikely. You ask me if I'm going to talk about how do we get people to like you more quickly? This helps a great deal, and that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. When you get the conversation going in a positive direction with a lot of yeses and affirmative answers, you're way more likely, one, to get the person to like you, and two, to get to that ultimate yes, which is a closed sale. Yeah, we're off to the yes again. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, the other is the rule of fives, or five, and it's not to be confused with the rule of yeses. Okay, the rule of five basically states that people remember five things that they are told most often. Now, the reason this is important in a selling scenario is salespeople are guilty of something that I call VD. <laughs> I always get the last. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, VD is not VD. It is verbal diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> Salespeople are guilty of verbal diarrhea. Hi, my name is Brian. I'm calling from PLI. We're the biggest. We're the best. We do this. We do that. We've got this customer and that customer. I can save you this. I can save you that. Blah, 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 blah. Sound familiar? VD. Okay, verbal diarrhea. Okay, here's the problem with verbal diarrhea. Let's go back first to the first thing we talked about, and that was we know people hate to be sold, right? Love buying stuff, but they hate to be sold. When you launch into verbal diarrhea, you're in full-on sales pitch mode from the word go. Hi, my name is, boom, let me sell you something. And here's why you should buy from me. What you've done is immediately put them on the defensive. You've immediately put their guard up, and you're going to immediately get the just look at me. Send me your information. I'll take a look at it. We're happy right now. We're fine right now. I like my supplier. I don't need anything right now. We got plenty of keys in stock. We're not doing another event for another six months. Call me then. Sound familiar? That's why. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to avoid VD, which is a good rule to live by. Okay, and, and we're going to talk about how you get past a lot of that stuff in general. Okay. The last thing, and we're wrapping up here pretty quick. The last thing is no. The last thing is mirroring. Okay, and you've heard salespeople refer to, at least I refer to them a lot of times as chameleons. Okay, you, here's the thing with mirroring. Mirroring just talks about basically emulating the style, the pace, the protocol of the person that you are speaking to. It's always a good idea to try and address the audience that you're talking to. I'm a New Yorker by birth and lived out in California, but I still got a lot of New Yorker in me. So as you can tell, I can get going pretty fast and furious. If I'm speaking with somebody down south who doesn't quite like those damn Yankees and doesn't like somebody who talks really fast and aggressive, 
I got to bring it back a notch for two or three or five. Okay, that's speaking to and addressing to my audience. A big important thing here too with mirroring is protocol. If I call somebody and they answer the phone, Mr. Johnson, and I'm like, hey, Billy, how you doing? Not a good way to get the conversation started. Okay, clearly he's showing that by protocol, he's answering the phone, Mr. Johnson. He expects to be referred to as Mr. Johnson until he gives you permission otherwise. First silly mistake that a salesperson can make that in essence is going to get you your first no because you've made a mistake. So it's already got you off on the wrong foot, and now you've got to try and recover from it. Okay? Here's the thing really with mirroring that's important. Have you ever found, and those of you that work in a sales environment for a long time, there always seems to be certain salespeople that are good with certain types of customers, but they're not good with other types of customers. Those are people, honestly, that are not as good as they should be at mirroring. Okay, because they're only clicking with a certain type of person, and that's typically a person that is similar to how they are. I'd like to think I can sell anywhere and everywhere, and I have. I sold all over Asia, Europe, Middle East, you know, South America, Central America, U.S., Canada, you name it, successfully. Now, you're dealing with different cultures, different languages, different people, different expectations, different everything. If you approach every customer and every person one way, you're going to hit with some, you're going to miss with many. So what I will suggest to you is that if you really want to be a very broad-based, successful salesperson, really try and embrace the concept of mirroring and work on that skill set. Become a chameleon. Be able to change it up. I mean, I'm, I go down to Texas all the time, and like two days in, I'm already talking with a Texas draw. You know, because I just I, I immerse myself in it, and that's what I do. Some people call it schizophrenia. Other people call it being a good salesperson. Okay? But mirroring is really, really, really important. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow as well. Any questions on any of that? No? All right, let's sum up and then let's talk some Q&A and go over some other things with you guys real quickly. The whole idea of this session was, like I said at the beginning, to give you guys a clearer understanding of why we have metrics, okay, in the first place, and why they're important. And then secondarily, but I think even more importantly, how they can actually benefit you. If you guys embrace the concept, which I hope after today you have, if not completely, at least more than you did in the past, okay? Take the concept of the daily worksheet. Don't wait for Randy, Linda, or anybody else to do this for you. All right, I'll email every one of you a copy of it after the meeting today. Okay, fill it out. If you have a sales goal, fill it out. Break it down, use the 1031, figure out what do I need to do on a daily basis to hit that goal. Do it for yourself. Don't do it for anybody else. Do it for you. That is how you will be able to use metrics to your favor, and in your favor, I should say, versus it just being a tool that management's using to measure you, you know, gauge you, whip you, beat you, whatever they might be doing with it. Okay? Use it for your own benefit. Time management and consistency. Can't stress it enough. Okay? Going back again to the Phil Jackson MJ scenario, what Phil Jackson really gave MJ was clock management, that discipline, that understanding of, hey, you do this at this time, that at that time, and he expected consistency every single game. Give me your A game, give me your 100% every single time. And he's known for benching his best players because they had a bad attitude or they weren't playing their hardest or whatever. Okay, A lot of coaches do that, yeah, I guess to teach a lesson, but you know, why do you want somebody in there who's not really in it? And you know yourself if you come to work, like I said earlier, and you're either in it or you're not in it. You're either giving 100% or you're not giving 100%. Anybody have any questions on the metrics specifically? Again, why we measure them, how we measure them, why they're so important, or does everybody feel they have a better understanding of that? Yes? Okay. What about time management, delegating, relegating, dumping, not dumping? How do you guys feel about that? Do we need to spend any more time on that? We're good? Okay. What about any of the other stuff? I'm not going to give you all the good juicy stuff you want on the rule of yeses and all the other stuff. Okay, because we will cover it in the next section. But any other questions just in general on those topics? Alright, um, questions. Any questions. It doesn't have to be on the material necessarily. It could any questions that you might have, stuff that you've been struggling with, working on, problems that you're having, or any general questions? I'm game. Yep. Well, because we're in Christmas, so 
Yeah, I mean, up, yes, upselling is as much a part of selling as selling. Well, because I'm taking that, that 10 3 one, I'm just trying to apply it to us in some kind of creative way. We don't actually have a sales goal, so it's part of my memory. Okay. So. Well, I mean, the 10 3 one is not just about the sales goal. I mean, you could still apply it in the sense that, you know, do they give you any metrics to measure now? I mean, they're still looking at how much time no. you spend on the phone. And, no. No? No. No, we measure goal because so as far as I know, you're in Shannon's group, right? I believe that's just for like the sales admin and the sales administrator. Because like myself, like how your plan is, mm -hmm. right? We have like somebody that handles like the distributors and stuff like that. That's my job. Right. So we're all in a different class than the sales admin, admin and the salespeople. Okay. So, but I feel like every call can just be a little bit better. I, I believe that. And and part I of it oh, I would, I would agree. We get a, this is what we want, and then it stops there, and I say thank you. I mean, I know. That's because know. that's how you were trained, or because. Yeah, I mean, sure. There's a couple of upselling questions we do. Okay. But I mean, I really think that we could get more goal, have more goals, mm -hmm. and then have more information on how to upsell. It's a little bit better. More information about why we should upsell more. So at this point, you're not being encouraged. So if, a, if somebody calls in and just says, hey, I want to reorder the same number of keys I ordered last time, yeah. you take the order, say thank you for your business, and yeah. you're done? Right. You're supposed to, if somebody calls in and says, hey, I want to order 3,000 key cards. Oh, well, how are you doing on your envelopes, cleaning cards, door swaps, whatever your stuff that you're supposed to be doing on every single one? Okay, that's up selling. That's fine, but I feel like I need a little bit of like, trick exposure. Okay. I'm just to to sell, do that. Like, okay. Like, you know. No, we're good. Okay. Well, and yeah, and we'll we'll definitely talk about that tomorrow. That's simply just overcoming objections. Again, we're good. It's just another form of I'm just looking. Um, you haven't given them a compelling reason. Maybe there isn't a value. Uh, you know, not to speak for Randy, Linda, or them, but I will discuss it with them. A lot of times what we do is we incentivize that. You know, so if you buy something else along with a reorder of another item, we give you some kind of a discount or an incentive. And they're like, oh, well, if I buy it now with my reorder, I get 10% off. Okay. That, oh, you know. we don't do that. No, I don't. But I'm saying there are a lot of different things that can be done to stimulate that. Uh, you know, right now we're having a Christmas and June sale because we have a lot of holiday stuff that we have in stock that I want to liquidate some of that inventory. So, you know, every single sales call that they make or receive, I better hear them mention Christmas in June. Mm -hmm. And it's already resulted in about 10 orders in the last two days. Because, you know, people aren't thinking about the holidays yet. It's June. Right. They're thinking about the beach and the whatever. Mm -hmm. We want to start getting to think about it. So there are a lot of things that you can do like that. Mm -hmm. But trust me, they get a lot of, no, that's okay. You know, I'll wait a couple of months. Right. And I say, well, why would, you know, why wait a couple of months? You won't be able to take advantage of the discount now. And that's when the selling comes into play. It's really easy to just take the no and say, okay, and hang up. Mm -hmm. But that's when you really got to kind of kick in the sales gear and <laughs> obviously convince them otherwise. I mean, I do see our, the other side of the Super Bowl. They upsell. They mm -hmm. talk about why we think the orders are going to go. We just say, this is what we have. This is what brought us to this day. It's not necessarily have a, a feel of why you should order more. You know, what are the benefits right now for you to get these things? Well, we have a lot more than four products. Well, what, you know, you what you would say yeah. before Mm -hmm. and then that's it. They say, now, like, well, we're, we're talking a lot about that. I mean, right now, as you guys know, you've been very departmentalized, right? Where one group does one thing, another group does another thing, and there's very little, if any, cross-selling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I think over time we're going to have to modify a little bit. And I'll give you a perfect example why. I mean, we're selling gift cards, loyalty cards, and things like that in Nashville. Well, I'm selling those to restaurants in the hotels that you're selling keys to. So you're already talking to the hotel, you're already talking to the same person, but nobody here is talking about gift and loyalty yeah, cards. I want to build y'all on like my little, this is thank you for your order. Hmm? Okay. I'm partnered with Tool. Okay. And she does. Okay. She does sell the gift cards. I bet you something very off the wall. She used to be on the sales team. Yeah. She used to be in your, oh, okay. She used to be on the advertising department. Yeah. So it's kind of just like that for her. Right. Yeah, she sends a lot of them to me, yeah, because she, and I know she's already, because I've already given her a spiel, and here you go. Well, let me ask you, when somebody calls back to, calls back to order, let's say, 2,000 cards, mm -hmm. do you ask qualifying questions like, how long is that going to last you? No, absolutely not. Huh. No. <laughs> I mean, that is, I mean, I'm always afraid of how to take the order, basically. Okay. You know, how to do that effectively once I'm off the phone, make sure that I do it properly. Okay. And what I do with payment. We don't necessarily have gone through in depth of, like, going, talking with 
salon, you say, okay, there's an event going on. Oh, okay, let me, right. you know, connect you there. Okay, you want an envelope for a certain event? I can get you over that department. There's just really nothing to talk to them about. All right, the best advice I'm going to give you, and this is a good takeaway for you from this meeting, is whenever someone orders anything, the immediate question you ask is how long is that quantity going to last you? Customers are a creature of habit. And if they ordered 2,000 last time, they go back into the notes, they go, oh, I ordered 2,000 last time from PLI. Let me call PLI again and order another 2,000. They don't, buyers in particular at hotels, they are, I'm going to use a hard, they are lazy as the day is long. Okay, they go, they go into their file real quick and they do exactly what I just described. 2,000 last time, 2,000 again. No, I'm good, thank you. But if you open up a dialogue where you say, well, how long is that going to last you? Well, we are, or, or look in the notes and go, man, they're coming back every three months and ordering 2,000 cards. It would be in their best interest. Maybe we did a blanket order for more cards so they can get a lower price per card. Instead of ordering 2,000, why don't you order 4,000? Your price would be this instead of that. Do that. It is a customer Okay, well, then that's... Okay, so that, that, and that's what I'm talking about. If you're doing that, I mean, those are the best upsell questions that you can do in a scenario like that. But I would suggest that you cross-sell as much product as you can. You know, like she said, if you're not asking on every single phone call, do you need any door hangers, channel guides, you know, robe cards, whatever, you know, you, you have to ask every single hotel that question. You have to. And if it's not been a part of your training, it will be. And again, that comes back to what we talked about today is consistency. That one phone call you didn't ask about it is the one time you missed an opportunity or one of the times you missed an opportunity. You know, you literally have to ask every single time because it comes back to 1031. If I only ask three people, how many people am I actually going to close, right? But if I ask 100 people that question, oh, yeah. see what I, I mean? How much more likely is it that I'm going to yeah. get? Yeah. So you, and that's where the 1031 applies in your world is okay. be consistent. Don't ask 10 people that question. Ask all 100 that question. Right. And all of a sudden, watch your up sales go up. Your tickets are going to go up. You know, Shannon's going to be going, holy moly, why are your orders now this instead of that? And that's the kind of attention you want, not the why aren't you making your calls and why aren't you hitting your numbers. Yeah. You got a question back there? I know that we just, of course, now I do a lot of um, fixed calls. Mm -hmm. But sometimes how do you answer when they answer the phone and they put you on hold and you just Whole music. Right. All of them don't have whole music. Some of them actually say what they have at their property. Is that not a good way to kind of go into, well, I see you have this, this, and this. Do you have someone that manages that part of your, like, some hotels have, like, weddings, mm -hmm. lots of weddings, or events. Some only have just, like, the baby name or something. Right. But, <laughs> well, I mean, you get one of them up there. Sure. Some of the other ones have different types of amenities on the property. Right. Is no, that, not a good way that, is, that is a great way, but I'd suggest an even better way, and that's the Internet. I mean, and we'll talk about this tomorrow. Before you pick up the phone and call any hotel, the first place you should be is on their website because that's going to tell you all the services, how many rooms they have, do they have restaurants on property, do they not, do they have a wedding and catering facility or not. You know, that really gives you an idea right up front. Okay, what am I getting myself into? If it's a 50-room bottom of the barrel days in property like you're describing, what's the best I can hope for out of this property? A hundred key card order, right? You know, they're, they're not going to buy do not disturb signs. They're not going to buy this. They're not going to buy that. They don't have any restaurants. They don't, you see what I mean? So it's all part of the qualifying process to say, but, but here's the thing, your time is valuable as well. And I don't like salespeople that are wasting their time on customers that aren't going to produce a result. So it's important that as salespeople, we qualify every opportunity, and we're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow as well. You know, what calls are worth making and what calls are not worth making, and how many calls do you make to somebody before you pull the plug? The salespeople ask me that all the time. Like, how many calls is enough call? When I can finally go to my manager and say, all right, I surrender. You know, this one's not going anywhere. I'm not getting anywhere with this one. And I love it when salespeople actually do that because then I can help strategize with them and maybe help them overcome the barrier or the gatekeeper or the voicemail heck that they're wrapped up in or whatever. Or maybe I just have the wrong salesperson on the account. And that happens quite a bit. I just switch it up. I give it to another person. They take a little bit of a different approach, different angle. You know, some people prefer to deal with men. Some people prefer to deal with women. You just never know. So, you know, you mix it up. So, yes. Are you going to touch up tomorrow about 
because we all know it's all about the dollar. Yes, I understand the sales that you're supposed to be a great salesperson. I understand that you're supposed to go after you know hotels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the hotels, their main response is it's all about the dollar. Mm -hmm. Well, this company is a dollar cheaper. This company is three six cheaper. This company is a nickel cheaper. Are you going to give us like strategizing ideas of how to go around that to get their victory, or is it just like a lost cause? No, it's never a lost cause. Yeah, and the answer is absolutely yes. That's what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about tomorrow. Look, here's the reality. The economy obviously has had an effect on sales this year, okay? Right? We can go, duh, right? I mean, that's, that's just a reality. Here's the other reality, though, and you'll hear me repeat this tomorrow. When every survey that has ever been done of buyers, either commercially or just personally, when they're asked, why did you buy X product? Price is at best third, fourth, or fifth on the list. That's no, it's a no, 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 no. It's a, it's a very fair. It's a, it's a very fair question. That is that is in two thousand. That was in two thousand and nine. What's funny? What's ironic? I'll even say is that that same survey done of salespeople, as asking why do you think they didn't buy? What do you think the answer is? Price. Number one on the list is price. So buyers are saying they bought because, and price is three, four, five down on the list. Why they bought was because of quality, service, you know, need. There's a lot of other reasons, and then all of a sudden price comes in. I'm not going to sit here and BS you and tell you price never factors. Price does factor. I'm just saying it's not as high up on the list as most people think it is. When somebody gives you a price objection, sorry to say it, it means you just haven't done your job. It means that you haven't successfully yet overcome whatever objections they've had. Now, if you've done all of that and they're still simply a price buyer, no offense because I shop there too, you are simply a Walmart Kmart shopper. Meaning you are less concerned with maybe certain conveniences or service or whatever, but what you are concerned about is I want to get in, I want to get out, and I want to get the lowest possible price. And there, and there are customers like that, and there are ways to overcome those objections as well. But here's the thing. We don't sell to everybody. We're not going to sell to everybody. You know, we talked about the ratios, and we didn't spend as much time on it maybe as we should have, but if you're closing at a rate of 30%, what does that mean? No, no, that's not what I mean. You're, that means that 7 out of 10 times somebody told you no. That's the reality of sales. Think about it. 7 out of 10 times somebody told you no thank you. Above average sales, people close at 50%. That still means 5 out of 10 times you were told no, 50% of the time. Not a big baseball fan personally, but it kills me. It's so funny to me. The best hitters in baseball, excuse me. Anybody a baseball fan? What, what's a good hitting average in baseball? Huh? 500. What is 500? 5 out of 10. 5 out of 10. 50%. Those guys are rock stars. And get paid millions of dollars a year to, hit, to miss the ball half the time. Does everybody get that? And then some of the best players that have a bad day or a bad season, they're hitting at 200. Right, but Hank, but here's here's our 30 percent again, guys. It's consistent. The mathematicians love this stuff. What's an average hitter in baseball hit? 300. 300. 30 percent. 30 percent. We don't make this stuff up. They okay. Out more than they do. they, they struck. Get walked to the base more than they really do. Because <laughs> somebody gets pulled with that ball. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. <laughs> if a lot of customers is that nickel does make a difference. Sure. And we all know that CLI doesn't have the lowest prices. But we do have the best quality. We have great sales reps. We have good service, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's all with the economy. I mean, every department and everything is shrinking, and everyone feels the pinch. Like, I'm not going to answer Ann's phone. I have Ann's phone call. I'm going to email back because I don't have time. Because I have 20 other things to do. So it's all those little tidbits. No, so you seem and, and you're, very well versed at what you do. And that's what I hear the room is, is that if you can touch on all of those little things, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's important. But it is a domino effect. And not no well, no. Here, the guys, here, here. I didn't even get that. Okay, uh, hang, hang on. Here, here's, here's yeah. Here, here's the reality. Everything you said is 100% accurate, and the reality is, the, the, the voicemail is unavoidable. 
and it's not it's not a byproduct of a tough economy or 2009, 10, 11, or 12. It's just a it's a very preeminent thing in the U.S. business culture. Okay, it's funny when you do business in Europe and other parts of the world. It's amazing people actually pick up the phone, and they'll actually show you the courtesy of calling you back. That is not a byproduct of the U.S. market for whatever reason. We're all busy. We're all working, you know, like crazy. We got two kids at home. We got this going on. We got that going on. That's just the nature of our culture, and we like to hide behind the anonymity and the security of voicemail and email. We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about that tomorrow. I'm not suggest. I'm not gonna give you tricks. Well, I'm gonna give you some. I'm gonna give you some tips, not tricks, tomorrow to how you can avoid the voicemail altogether. But I'm also gonna help you deal with the voicemail when you get it. Because it's not going to be avoidable all the time. And the reality is, is most of the time it's not going to be avoidable. Email is a powerful tool, but that's all it is, is a tool. Salespeople have become dependent on selling via email, and they're not taking control of the situation or taking control of their customer. We all know a customer, given their choice, would rather hide behind voicemail and email because it's anonymous, right? It's a lot easier to say no to somebody when you don't have to hear their voice. Exactly. It's a it's a lot easier to say no when you don't have to look them in the face and tell them no, okay. It's less time consuming. It's faster. You can multitask. You can email. You yeah, can email. Abs absolutely. So we're not saying avoid any of those tools. We're going to hopefully tomorrow help you better use those tools and get through. So here's the thing: the reality of what you're dealing with a lot is not only people crunched for time, and companies are doing more with less, or they're trying to do more with less. Some not even trying to do more. Some are trying to do as much with less. Okay, they're just trying to hold on. That is the reality. So all the objections that I expected to hear, I've been hearing, and we will be addressing them tomorrow. You know, because it, it is just a simple reality. But to go back to what you were saying, it is not just a byproduct of the economy. The economy has obviously tightened things up. But like anything else, there's always a silver lining in everything. The good, the good thing in a tightening economy is customers a year or two ago that were genuinely happy with their existing suppliers and might not have honestly given you the time of day, guess what? They are looking for that extra nickel. They are looking for that better value, and they are going to be way more open to hearing what you have to say. That's the positive byproduct that has come out of this economy. We were, people here in Asheville have been calling on companies like Darden and o OSI and these very large restaurant chains long before we bought Plastic Cart Plus. When we bought Plastic Card Plus, that became the hub for all of our gift and loyalty activity, right? So we started calling on OSI and Darden. One, I think our approach was a bit different because of the way we approached it and I do things. But secondly, they were way more open to making a change because Darden buys, you know, 40 million cards. 40 million cards times a half a penny, a penny or two, a lot of money. Okay, so whereas they've been, the OSI has been using their same vendor for the last nine years. Nine years. That means other companies have been knocking on that door for nice. Let me in. Nope, we're good. Guess what? This year they want out for quote, and they put an RFP out. Wow. Okay. Really? So yeah. So that's the opportunity that this kind of an economy and this kind of market creates. The struggle or frustration on management's part is we're going to miss those opportunities if you guys aren't on the phone. That brings us all the way full circle to what we started talking about. If we're not in front of these customers especially the tough ones. The ones that were saying no to us a year ago are exactly the ones we should be calling today because they're the ones that are going to be way more open to listening to what you do have to say. Here's the thing about price, and this is what we're going to talk about a lot more tomorrow. Price isn't always about price. It's about value. Okay, And value is a subjective term. It means different things to different people. It means something completely different to me than it means to you. The trouble salespeople get themselves into is they try and put their value judgment on their customer. Well, I think it's a good deal. Why don't you think it's a good deal? Okay, It doesn't matter whether you think it's a good deal. It matters whether they think it's a good deal. And when we talk about it being a good deal, the price is only one component in it. Go back to the Walmart-Kmart analogy. Okay, If I go to buy something at Nordstrom's, okay, which is a more expensive department store, I know walking in there, I'm not going to get any bargains or deals per se, but what I do know I'm going to get is a higher level of quality, a higher level of service. I can wear the shirt for a year and I go, yeah, I don't like it. I want another shirt. Bring it back and they're going to give me another one. That's not happening at Walmart and Kmart. 
right? So I make a judgment, I make a value judgment, say I'm willing to spend a little bit more money, sometimes a lot more money, okay, to get this because this is what I'm going to get with it. See what I mean? And I'm just trying to give you an example. It could be anything, but people make those value judgments all the time. They make them in the clothes they wear, the cars they drive, the things they buy, the food they eat. It's no different when it comes down to key cards, advertising cards, events, all the same. It's all the same. And like I said, we'll spend a lot more time in depth tomorrow talking about, okay, now that we know that, how do we deal with it? You know, and how do we get somebody who's stuck on saving a nickel to see that they're not maybe really even saving for the nickel? You know, we talk about things like total cost of acquisition. Have you guys ever heard that? Okay. Nothing ever costs just a nickel. How much is the shipping? You know, is there tax involved? Is there this involved? Are they charging you any additional fees? Are you sure we're comparing yeah, apples to apples? <laughs> yeah, you know, they say, yeah, forty nine ninety nine a month, plus tax, plus state tax, federal tax, plus this, that, that. All of a sudden, your bill is $65. How the heck did that happen? Right? Are we really talking about $49? Are we really talking about $0.05? Cents? Those are the types of qualifying questions you've got to ask when you're met with a price situation like that. And we'll spend more time talking about it tomorrow. But does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, and if... And here's the reality is, uh, <laughs> this is a, a bit of a stereotype and a cliche, but it applies. Buyers are liars. Okay, buyers are liars. Very rarely, I'm not saying never, but very rarely is a buyer telling you the truth. The old joke, you know how a buyer is lying? You know how a buyer is lying? Their lips are moving. Okay. Yeah, so it applies to all of them. Used car salesman, lawyer, now you can use it. It's, it's universal. Okay. But that's the truth. So you've got to cut through what's truth and what's not. And there are qualifying questions that you can ask that will help you.